Kate Williams leads 1% for the planet. That's an organization that's all about helping businesses give back to the environment. And today we're gonna to explore how companies like Flickr are making a huge impact by dedicating 1% of their revenues to support sustainable causes. This really feels like a story of how purpose and business and drive can all work together to change the world. Kate, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, I'm so glad to be here. Like we were, we were just talking about in the green room there, just the, the idea of the origin story and how all this stuff came about. So, you know, I've read your bio, I've done my research. I'm hoping you can encapsulate your, you know, your superhero origin story for us, like the elevator pitch. Someone asks you, asks you about 1% for the planet, what's the response? Yeah, so 1% does have a great um, founding story. So Yvonne Chouinard, who's the founder of Patagonia, the company Patagonia, and his yeah. buddy Craig Matthews, who had a company called uh, Blue Ribbon Flies, they were fishing together on the Madison River in Montana doing their favorite thing. And they were talking about how they use their companies as a way to create you know, positive impact through giving to nonprofits. And they, you know, felt like that mattered and it was a part of the way that they protected the landscapes where people could fish and wear their clothing. So it was good for business and good for the planet. But the sort of main part of that conversation that is our founding is they realized like if just a couple of companies here and there are doing it, it doesn't matter or it's not enough. And so they wanted to create something that would be the movement builder. So they created 1% for the planet as the movement builder for this practice of companies embedding, giving back into how they do business. And so that is, that's, that's how we were born. And we have existed as a movement builder for the past 22 years, engaging more and more companies in this, this annual practice of uh, giving back as part of their core business strategy. And how has that been the, the convincing part for the companies to give back? Is it and what are they giving back? So obviously one percent. So is it one percent of net? Is it one percent of gross? How 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 does that math work out? Yeah. So the way it works is that it's one percent of um, revenues. So it's a real number, and that that's very intentional, both to make it you know a real number. Like your revenues are your revenues. Your profits may you know sort of you can fudge them a little bit, not saying that people like lie about their profits, but you know, you can, you, they, they can be variable. Whereas your revenues, you have an up year, you have a down year, you still have a, like you have the revenues that you have. So 1% really fits in as a very core operational expense and that matters. So it's a, it's a real number. It's one that is, you know, every single year, something that you're going to um, allocate. And then the way it works is that we don't operate as a foundation. So we don't take in all of the 1% and then distribute it on the behalf of companies. We advise, support, um, and enable companies to give directly to environmental partners that we also vet. So we have a really fabulous um, set of impact areas and we we have eligibility guidelines associated with those. And then we vet nonprofits, environmental partners against those. And then we help our companies to find the ones that are the best fit for them. So every single year, the members, which is what we call our businesses who join, every single year, our members give their 1% and we certify that they have done that. Oh, wonderful. And then as part of that certification, there's other things that happen. And we'll talk about that. I'm, I'm curious, though. So the the, the the allocation process for the, the participants or the companies that are contributing the 1%, how does that work? Is it they're contributing this 1% of revenues into a bucket and then you and your organization determines how that bucket is allocated? Or do those companies decide, hey, we are really passionate about these particular uh, areas and that's where we want our money to go is these companies or just these particular kinds of efforts? How does that split happen? Yeah, it's a, I really like that question because it's a really important part of what we do, which is that every single company that joins as a member is part of the 1% for the planet brand. So we're a you know, unified collective community, but each company is determining their own giving strategy. So every single company who's part of this unified brand is differentiated by how they choose to give. So we have four impact areas, uh, resilient communities, just economies, rights to nature, and conservation and restoration. And all of our many thousands of environmental partners fit into those, you know, one or more of those impact areas. And then each company 
we work with them. We're, you know, our role is advisors, certifiers. Um, we work with them to determine their particular giving strategy, like what's going to help them tell their brand story, what is most meaningful for their employees, where can they volunteer. You know, we really help each company develop that matrix of strategy that's going to help their giving um, to be the most powerful it can be. And then they give directly to environmental partners across those impact areas, one or more. And then at the end of their year, we certify that. And then they oh, okay. start over. So then the sort of, uh, that was my next question. So then the certification process, what does that comprise? Are you auditing to make sure the funds went to the, the areas that the company is intended or how, how's that policed? Yes, it's both a, like I would say, it's a rigorous and celebratory process because it's a great thing to certify every year because, you know, it really is a um, high credibility commitment. So, you know, members, the businesses submit documentation of their revenue and documentation of their giving, which would be like, you know, acknowledgement letters or receipts from the environmental partners that they've given to. They submit all of that. You know, we, we try and make it as smooth and easy as possible, um, but still rigorous. And then, you know, we celebrate. It's a great thing to have certified that you've done that. It's a big commitment. And then, you know, again, you like lean into the next year and, you know, figure out like, do we want to tweak how we're giving? What have we learned from the past year? And then you, you know, you do it again. And what we see is that, you know, with each passing year, the company's really embedded in their strategy. It starts to be a bigger part of how they communicate their brand, how they engage staff, how they, you know, hire, how they address operational challenges. Like it really becomes this awesome embedded part of their strategy. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. What a, what a great project, right? Cause it, it just feels, you know, reading through your bio and reading through the information about 1%, it just feels like this is one of those, those projects that, you know, you probably lose sleep on at night because there's always something that you're, you know, you're chasing the horizon and you're always doing something, but the things that you're doing are, helping the planet, obviously, right? You're helping mankind versus, you know, not to diminish things, but uh, another tech product or, you know, another software as a service or something. This is, this is real stuff that's really going to affect us and generations after us. How does that, you know, being at the, 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 the tip of the spear for, for an effort like that, is that, does that make you feel pressured, like a lot of responsibility to get this done or to keep the momentum moving forward? Or, you know, is it, oh, yeah, whatever, you know, and next I'm going to go make, I'm going to do a startup. Or, you know, how, how does it, how do you, how does that play out in your mind? Yeah, I mean, it, it, there is a lot of meaning and, um, you know, a lot of, um, so there's meaning in our mission. There's also a level of like commitment to the relationships. You know, I, I take it really seriously that each of our businesses is committing 1% of their revenues. Like that's a big deal. And so we, you know, I do take that seriously. So I, you know, I would say that it, it is, you know, feels like my life's work um, mm -hmm. to, you know, ensure that I'm like doing the best that I can and engaging my staff and growing our organizations in the best way that that we all can together is very much a team effort to um, serve this larger mission, to you know be responsive and connected to our members, to be supportive of our environmental partners. You know, so we have so many stakeholders globally, and I do feel a big obligation to you know be our best for them. And you know, at times that can feel heavy, but most of the time it really feels like what a gift to get to be. Um, doing work that is so meaningful in relationship with people who are really committed. So, um, you know, I, I am very grateful that I get to do this work and I do not take it lightly. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot of responsibility. Yeah. And that, that's great. Congratulations on the successes so far. And uh, you're not stopping, right? You're going <laughs> to, this is going to keep There's going. There's a lot for... more to do. I'm in it. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I want to I want to go back in time. So we talked a little bit about the present and kind of where and we'll we'll talk about the future a little bit in a second. But let's go back. So your your background is you know educational wise is MIT, Sloan, and Princeton. And what was the with with those credentials, you pretty much could have gone anywhere and done anything or built anything and had maybe a similar impact on the planet. What was it about this particular in, in, initiative that was like okay? I need to move in this direction versus pure profit motive and pure, you know, entrepreneurialism. Yeah, well, so when I was, you know, getting my degrees, I didn't have like, must be CEO of 1% for the planet. You know, my motivation, <laughs> yeah. you know, for 
good or ill has always been meaning. Um, and it's almost like I didn't know how not to pursue a path that didn't, wasn't meaningful for me. So, and, and for me, that meaning has been defined by a real connection to the outdoors personally, and a real curiosity about how do you organize people to do hard things. Like I was a history major in college and, you know, a lot of what I was studying, even though I couldn't articulate it in this way at that time, but a lot of what I was studying was like, you know, how, how is it that people have come together to do hard things over time? And then through my own experience as an outdoor educator, um, you know, doing hard things in the outdoors with groups of people, like I, you know, to learn, how do you do that? How, when is, when is keeping it fun? The thing that matters, when is learning harder skills, the thing that matters, what's the mix? How do you tap into different people's strengths? Like probably in a sort of nerdy way. I've always been like interested in that. And, you know, those two threads of like love of the outdoors and of wild places and curiosity about kind of collective action is how I would now say it is what has been the kind of thread that, you know, in the last 10 years has brought me to 1% for the planet where I, you know, again, I feel very grateful that I get to do this work. I love that. So, so the, the f- part of the future facing questions I'm going to ask you are about what's, what's next, obviously. And then are we looking at a 2% for the planet? Is that the, <laughs> is that the, the increment that we want to, want to go up? Um, but before that, I want to, I want to talk a little bit about the, the, one of the reasons that you and I are speaking today is through Flickr, you know, an in, in, introduction from the Flickr team. Uh, and they are participating as one of the one of your the, the companies in this portfolio. Can you ex- how did that come about? Like, did they did Flickr approach you? Did you approach them? I know Flickr is all about, you know, conservation and giving back in, you know, a myriad of different ways. I'm curious how this union came together, because it seems like a perfect match. Yeah, and it's a great question because it really sort of clarifies or, or is a great illustration of how our model works. So so we got to know Flickr. One of our staff members was in a, at an event hosted by one of our environmental partners, and Flickr was supporting that environmental partner. And so through this event and conversation, they um, were able to sort of connect the dots of like, wait a second, like we should be, you know, through what we're already doing, we can amplify it even more through 1% for the planet. So they um, they joined uh, just in the in this past year and um, have really so quickly like leaned into sort of seeing the opportunity because they already were um, you know a committed um, environmental um, advocate and yeah. so one percent of the planet has been kind of a, a wonderful next step in their journey that we're so grateful to get to share with them in you know kind of communicating a important and big story through their particular, you know, skill set of photography and storytelling, um, about, you know, how we can, how we can, um, add value for a a thriving future. Yeah. And how's that going so far? Like, how's the, 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 I know there's an auction component to it and, and other things. How, how is the whole suite going? Oh yeah. They're, they're, you know, such a great member already. A lot of members, it takes understandably a little time to kind of figure out like, what's my giving strategy? What's the story I want to tell? I think Flickr came in, you know, with a pretty clear philosophy and strategy around what they wanted to do. So they've been able to really just jump in so quickly. And one of the ways that they have jumped in is as a presenting sponsor for our online auction, which is live right now through middle of November. And our auction is, again, another sort of illustration of our model because it's a um, catalog of products and services donated by our members um, and all of the proceeds of the auctions support our organization because we we are a nonprofit ourselves and we have work to do to sort of build and grow our capacity and ability to serve this growing network of members and environmental partners globally. And so our auction is one of the ways that we fundraise for ourselves. And it's such a, a great way to like showcase our amazing members to engage um, bidders who can be, you know, anywhere in the world um, who are interested in finding products and services that are aligned with their values. Um, and, and Flickr is really helping us to tell that story in a more beautiful and powerful way. I love it. And it's the beginning of a, of an amazing partnership, right? So very good. Yeah. I love it. When, when like-minded companies come together, that's when all this magic happens. Like I said, beyond the, you know, F stops and shutter speeds and the latest cameras and gear and software and all that. This is, this is kind of the stuff that we, 
we use our superpowers for and it sticks and it and it matters the the other companies i'm i'm curious in the portfolio the range of companies is it you know is is the portfolio mainly comprised of these giant companies that hey 1% you know you know we're making we're making gazillions of dollars anyway so 1% for the planet sure no problem or is it weighted more towards the individuals like startups and mom and pops you know in, in smaller businesses what's the what's the kind of range in between there yeah it's it's a both and so going back mm-hmm. to our origin story you know we were created as a movement builder so our philosophy and practice has been to build a movement, which means we have a really diverse network of members. So, you know, some of the ways I can frame that diversity, we're about 5,000 members right now that then, the, and again, the, the members are our businesses and they range in size from like pre-revenue to more than a billion in revenues. So we have a big spread. Um, we believe in the power of having businesses of all sizes because, the smaller businesses, many of those are, are the kind of bigger businesses of the future. And many of them are really building sustainability um, and commitment to the planet into their DNA. So we really want those small companies to um, be part of this thriving future that we're creating. We also love to have the bigger companies who are able to potentially reach a broader audience. Um, certainly, you know, their 1% is bigger, more dollars going to partners. So that full spread is a really important part of who we are. We're also spread across different industries. So we have 64 different industries represented across those 5,000 members, and it's very spread out. So no more than 10% of our network is in any one of those categories. So, you know, that's great because we're, you know, it's not just like you buy your outdoor clothing and that's, you know, sort of represents an environmental commitment. It's like everything from, you know, cosmetics to food and beverage and insurance and photography. So it's like products and services. So very diverse in that way. And then it's very diverse in terms of global footprint. So we're more than 50% outside of the U.S. at this point. We're um, U.S., Canada, Europe, Australia, Japan. And then, you know, we actually have members showing up in about a hundred countries at this point. So quite, quite a spread. So it's a, it's a big, diverse, beautiful movement. Wow. And what's, what's the process for recruiting members? And and the second part of that question is the, in terms of mind share or having the mindset for giving back or donations or charitable, charitable contributions for organizations like, like 1%, do you, is the idea to get entrepreneurs and new companies to be thinking about, you know, giving back and conservation and these sorts of efforts at the incept of the or early on in the company so that it's always part of, you know, what the what the CPA is looking at, you know, when they're when they're building out numbers or asking for money or these sorts of things. This the, the, the contribution piece should always be part of that. Or is it more of an education? Like you have to go call up and say, this is why it's great. And these other people are doing it. You should too. And this is how easy it is. Boom. Like what, how does, how does that mind share piece of it work? Yeah, it's really all of the above. So, um, you know, another form of diversity is like companies at different stages. Um, Mm -hmm. and what we, what we believe and what we are seeking to build is essentially a new economy where every business is like, Hey, we pay our rent. We wouldn't think of not paying our rent. Like when, you know, how can you get away with not paying your rent? We pay our staff and, you know, good companies seek to pay their staff well. Um, And we invest in the core assets that enable us to have a thriving business. And, oh, our planet and, you know, the ways in which we live on it well and in sustainable ways, that's a core asset that we need to invest in. And that's where 1% for the planet comes in. So we're trying to meet companies when they're founded when they're 50 years old and everything in between and, you know, beyond that range, anyone can join. And again, in the same way that a company of that's got one person or uh, that has a million people, um, it still, you know, has core investments that it makes to thrive. And we just really want to do all that we can to grow that network of businesses that are making that commitment and making it sort of the new business um as usual, or although it would be different than what business as usual is now, it's like the new way of doing business. And I think one of the key things in that is that we believe it's both the right thing to do and it's good 
a good there's a good business case for it. So consumers are interested in brands that are making the right choices for planet and people. And ultimately, any economy that we have for the long term can only survive and thrive on a planet that is thriving. And so, you know, it really is an important investment for the good of the business as well as for the planet and people. Yeah. Yeah. That's so good. I mean, it's so good. So this, you know, when I, when I'm looking at the, the research and your background and, you know, your lineage from, you know, your educational lineage, MIT Sloan, we mentioned that in Princeton, I'm curious from what from those from your educational background was directly, you know, do you directly contribute to your success with 1% of the planet? In other words, did MIT Sloan or Princeton give you anything that helped you create this this effort? Or was it like, oh, I can do this, but I'm going to use the other side of my brain or the other thing that I'm interested in and do this big thing over here? Did they, did they match up? That is a great question. Um, I think it was, it's probably less the direct um, content that I learned in those two um, institutions and more the um, kind of capacity and, um, you know, you know, <laughs> I don't know if I can say this, like the ass whooping of learning yeah. in a really challenging environment. Um, and coming to understand that um, I am capable of facing hard challenges and uh, being curious about how to learn through them. So I think I think on a daily basis, it's more that sort of ability to be like, OK, I may not see the answer right now, but I know that the work is to stay the course and to keep stay curious and to tap into all the resources of people and resources around me to um, figure out how we can sort of learn and get better. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. It's a, I like the, the stay the course because it's a journey, right? It's not necessarily, it's a journey without a destination, right? Cause I, I would imagine at some point you're going to, the baton is going to go to someone else who's going to push it forward and take it in different directions and all that. What, it, what does that, that look like? You know, I'm kind of skipping around in my notes here, but I'm, I'm curious about the, the future and where, where that might go compared to where we are now. Cause I feel like, you know, looking at the research, you're pretty, pretty dang successful right now. So where I know, and there's always more, right. But where would you like 1% for the planet to be in say 2030? And how does that, you know, the transfer over to, or handing the, the project over to someone else, is that built into the plan or is it just, we're just going to keep going till we, you know, till the wheels come off <laughs> as it were. Yeah. Well, we have uh, we have a big stated goal, then I'll share it here as like an invitation because it's a growth goal. So our our we have a it's a two part goal. One, we want to get to our first billion dollars, billion U.S. dollars in lifetime certified impact. So right now, um, you know, I meant I described our model earlier. Every member is certifying their giving every year, and we tally that up and we give annual totals and then we are always sort of tracking our lifetime total. Right now our lifetime total is 670 plus million US dollars. So we're on track and very focused on growing to our first billion in lifetime giving. So that's one part of the goal. The other part of the goal is to build the organization and movement that enables us to get to the next billion and the next billion faster because you know, much as we want to, uh, or we would all love to think there's a problem out there that we can solve and be done with it. As you were just saying, like the, the staying the course piece is so important because it's like, you know, we got work to do and it's going to be, you know, it's going to be going on for a while and we're going to mm -hmm. need more billions of dollars going to the awesome on the ground work that is creating solutions. So we want to hone our capacity and our ability to deliver on that billion again and again. So that's big work that is, you know, definitely will keep me busy for a while. And I'm, I'm excited about that. And it's, when I say keep me busy, it's never, ever me alone. It's our awesome staff team. It's very collaborative and it's our global movement of businesses, of nonprofits um, and of just friends and partners who, you know, are all leaning in to help us get to these goals. I love that. You know, aside from from monetary measurements or monetary 
metrics. Like, you know, we're going to billions of dollars, of course, that we're going to have that coming in over over the years. What how would you say you gauge the the progress of of overall environmental efforts, not just yours, but in generally for planet Earth? Like if there was a there was a you know, a, a bar graph that says this is the entirety of the issue or the problem, you know, across all of these spaces. We are kind of right here on the left. A little, you know, we're, we're just getting started. Are we at the halfway point? Are we almost to the finish line? Like from your perspective, what's our, what, what grade would you give conservational efforts right now or what percentage of completion if there is one? That is a challenging question, and I guess I'll answer it in a couple of ways. Not at all to deflect. Get, I'll give you a grade. I'll get there. Um, but okay. I would say like, the way I think about it is, so again, our four impact areas, just economies, resilient communities, rights to nature, and conservation and restoration, we're highly focused. We, we have a lot of belief in those four areas as um, – as having um, specific contribution contributions to creating a thriving future. So we're highly focused on getting resources into the partners that are doing work in those four impact areas. So what we measure is like, you know, the growth in dollars, the growth in resources going to those impact areas. And we track that every year and we track that in total over lifetime. And so for us, you know, one measure of, um, performance. So you asked about a grade, so I'll, I'll frame it in terms yeah. of performance is increasing dollars. So one way that I could sort of describe that we've made progress is when I started, we were annually certifying about 17 million US dollars. Last year, we certified 100 million US dollars. I, you know, if you were to like give it a grade, you know, so that means we've five x it. So I think that's pretty good. You know, I'd give us a strong grade. The, the reason I don't necessarily, that's not, not how I normally frame it is great. We're making progress now. How do we 10 exit? You know, so there's always like a next horizon. Um, but what we are always celebrating is, are we, you know, are we, um, sufficiently sort of amplifying and accelerating our efforts in terms of like beyond 1%, cause I know you're asking about that as well. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people would like for us to be able to say, like, here's the big environmental problem. Here's how much, you know, our dollars have contributed to solving it. We do not feel like we've been able to do that in any, you know, in a, and I don't know that anyone has been able to sort of answer that question. What we really focus on is, are there like meaningful, measurable stories of success that we can point to and communicate? So we have thousands of partnerships every year where, you know, dollars or other resources in kind donations or volunteer time are passing from our businesses to our nonprofits. And that's creating on the ground results, sometimes as small as, you know, an acre of urban land that's being saved and, and converted to a community garden. We see that as a success story and as a way in which we have sort of moved the needle in the right direction. You know, at other levels, it's much bigger and it might take more than a year to measure. And that's one of the things that I think is really important to keep in mind is some stuff you can measure in the short term, some stuff you measure in the long term, but you track progress towards that. So we are also tracking that. And we do a lot of that, again, through the resources, through the impact metrics that our environmental partner partners share within our four impact areas, and then through storytelling, because as, um, you know, as much as we would want to quantify all of it, a lot of times the ways that we're able to see and understand and really kind of uh, believe in that thriving future is through the stories of impact on the ground. Yeah, yeah. And and to continue that, that sort of vein of storytelling, um, tell me a story. Tell me a, a story of two of your, yeah, that, that come to mind of your your best success stories or maybe not the best monetarily but the most impactful in your mind or the ones that you are you know you like to tell at cocktail parties what what would two of those those stories be yeah i mean yeah you catch me at a given cocktail party and it's going to be a different story which is what <laughs> one of the things i love about our job is um or the work that i get to do and we get to do is that there's we just have you know almost this uh constant sort of 
you know, flowing river of stories coming at us because on a regular basis, our companies and nonprofit partners together are doing great things. So I'll tell a story from just last week. I was at our global summit with some of the Flickr team, which was amazing. And one of our speakers was um, two people from an organization called the Thin Green Line and they're the Thin Green Line Foundation. And the work that they do is to support um, rangers who are working as they're sort of the environmental protectors. They're you know, patrolling lands where there might be threats to wildlife from poachers or threats from development. And it's highly risky work. Um, you know, these rangers um, deal with injuries ranging from gunshot wounds from poachers to, you know, being gored by wild animals. So they're doing, they're kind of this front line, the thin green line, that's the name of defense for wild animals. And, you know, they are just doing this incredibly challenging but important work. And in real time at our event, when they were talking about their work, they shared one of the things that they're working on and, you know, named the amount of funds that they would need for, you know, in order to kind of focus some effort there. And they got that in like eightfold mm -hmm. in, within the next day um, through our community because they had shared their story. And so now like more rangers will have resources. They'll be able to um, invest in figuring out how they can um, bring some of their work to the Amazon region where they haven't done as much work yet. So like that's just one story from last week. And, you know, there truly are, you know, I could I could talk for hours sharing these really specific stories of powerful work. And I think that it, it's important to do that. And I love that you asked that question because I think it really um, illuminates the fact that, yes, we can sort of kind of talk about our big numbers and we we do that ourselves. We talk about our billion, but the power of the billion is made up of the $100, $500, $5,000 investments that people are making in these targeted efforts that have a really big impact for people and planet. And, you know, in this case for rangers doing this incredibly important, risky, not very well-known work that is the front line for threats to wild places and wild animals. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Mind blowing. And one of, one of the mind blowing parts of this is, you know, I know companies like Flickr, Smug Mug, et cetera, are, really plugged into this stuff, environmentalism and giving back and all the things. And I'm curious, you know, and I know there was a fair amount of effort with the, with, you know, the team lobbying and, you know, talking to important people to, to affect change and all this, which is, you know, I'm just in complete awe of all of you folks that are able to move, literally move mountains sometimes, right. With, 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 uh, your brains. And I'm wondering, you know, we're, we're coming up as we record this, it's October, October 23rd and we're coming up October 23rd, 2024. Right. So we're coming up on our election soon. And I'm wondering, does the changing of the guard in government, you know, particularly at the top, do those changes affect your efforts like at, at this level? Are there things that happen or things that you want to happen or things that aren't happening now that might happen? with the changing of the guard or things that will stop because the guard change, you know, how, how does that work out for you? Our, the way we sort of think about, um, government is that, you know, essentially if we think of society very broadly, it's having three sectors, so there's government, there's the private sector and there's the nonprofit sector. And in a given moment, depending on who's in office, depending on sort of what the economy is doing, the sort of, um, allocation of like positive impact from those different sectors is going to vary. So what we try and do is, you know, we are not a um, advocacy organization. We really try and center a thriving future for planet and people um, as the work that we do, regardless of um, who's in office which isn't to say we don't, you know, we aren't affected by that in the same way that, you know, any business citizen nonprofit is going to be affected by, you know, the particular policies of a seated government. Um, but what, you know, what we really try and focus on is staying kind of on the balls of our feet so that where, wherever things land, 
we're able to say like, okay, so what's the context we're now in and how do we do our really important work of setting up businesses to invest in the core asset of a thriving future? And so that's our focus certainly right now. And this has been a big year. You know, there've been 60, more than 60 national elections in countries totaling with, with populations totaling more than half of the planet's population. So more than 4 billion people have been in countries that have had national elections. So there's a lot of change afoot. And, and you know, we have definitely felt that in uncertainty as our members have navigated that uncertainty, as our nonprofits have navigated that uncertainty. And, you know, again, our, our work is to stay like, you know, face forward, balls of our feet, ready to, you know, support a positive future wherever things land. Yeah. And and just to be clear, you're the the organization is international, right? Where when we talk about 1% for the planet, we're not just talking about the United States where we tend to kind of be insular, right? We're talking about this this ball of dirt that we're on and conserving it versus this patch of land on it, correct? <laughs> Absolutely. And I'm really glad that you brought that up because we are, you know, we are headquartered in the US, but more more of our networks outside of the US than is in the US. So for us, um, you know, it really is. And we, you know, we're always sort of challenging ourselves and working, you know, receiving, you know, feedback and guidance from our members globally to truly show up as a global um, entity, because that's, you know, we are focused on the planet and our movement um, circles the entire planet. And so that's our focus. Yeah, I love that. Okay, so as we as we wrap this up, I want to just chat about um, like next steps in brass tacks for for you know let's call it photographers or creative professionals or whomever is listening to this interview. The the you know this past summer that we all went through together was on the hot side, right? So which got a lot of people thinking about, you know, what's happening to this planet that we're on and and what can I do? So these companies, whether they're an individual wedding photographer, mom and pop business, mom, you know, photographer all the way up through some guy in his basement writing the next Facebook all the way through to people that have billions of dollars in revenue, you know, annually or monthly. What um how how should they think about getting started with this stuff? Like, what are next steps at at a level of an individual solopreneur or you know that kind of business solo business operator? How do they get started, and can they have an impact if they're already just kind of like trying to make it from month to month, you know, and get their get some some momentum in their business? Should this be part of their 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 you know their QuickBooks sort of account, or should they put it down the line a little bit? Once we hit these revenue levels and we have you know we've we've accomplished some sort of stability in the business, then we'll think about this one percent stuff. Or should it just be right at the top as you're thinking about the business? You got to think about making sure your home is safe. You know, i.e. the planet. What do you think? Yeah, I think it's I think it's. Both and I think the the time is now and it's good for your business to do that. So it's like no. the, the one leads to the other. And, you know, I think particularly for this audience, I would share that, um, you know, I mentioned that we're across diverse industries. Our number one industry is professional services. And that includes photographers, creatives. You know, it's a very we have a strong um uh, involvement from that sector. And it's such a great fit because it's, you know, we are fundamentally a storytelling movement. That's, that's how we convey what we do. As I shared, you know, when I was struggling to answer, like, what grade do we give ourselves? Fundamentally, it's because we communicate stories of, uh, you know, story after story after story of powerful impact on the ground and photographers, creatives, um, are, incredible at doing that. And so to build that into your brand is a really great opportunity. So, you know, I would say like, take that 1% step now, um, whether your 1% is really small or bigger, you know, it's once you, you know, lean into it, it becomes increasingly a lift and not just an expense. So yeah. um, we have a great team that can share more information. And so I really would invite you to like, really step into the time is now, as you mentioned, it, you know, it was a hot summer, like there are real things to be involved in right now. And I can't tell you how powerful it is to be part of 
a movement, a community. I mentioned our global summit. It's an incredible community. So you um, step into the 1%, but you're not doing it alone. Your 1% joins other people's 1%, 5,000 1% to be this really big number, which everyone owns, and you get to have relationships across that community. So I can't emphasize enough how powerful and positive it is. Yeah. Yeah. We're all, we're all in this together a hundred percent. You know, the, the, my last, the, my last sort of question question for you is a little bit selfish, right? So I know there's a lot of conservational efforts going on and, you know, and your, your, the, the areas that, that 1% for the planet focuses on are, you know, like you said, diverse. One of the areas that I'm, that I, I think within the last year or so became uh, aware of. I was going to say passionate, but I'm not, I'm not knowledgeable enough about it to be passionate yet. We can aware of, and that's just the issue that we're having with the, the garbage patch in the, in the oceans, right. And the efforts that are being put together to clean that bit of our, our, our planet up. So when I, when I look at issues and there's, you know, lots and lots of different issues like that, that's just one of them. Right. But that's one that I, that if I, when I start this sort of, okay, I need to give back as well and start ha- helping my planet. If I'm walking down that path and I'm like, yes, I just listened to this interview. Kate's amazing. I want to get behind them and do what, you know, do what she's talking about to, to help push this thing forward. But from my perspective, I'm like, okay, but I want to help that first. I want that garbage in my oceans gone or used for something productive. Um, I've got extra money to donate to this, but I want to make sure it goes over there. Is for that person that has specific issues that they want to target or specific concerns, is there a way for them to kind of focus their, their, their dollars on that thing? Or is it OK, we're going to heat up this part of the of the issue. And your thing that you're concerned about is part of the things that we're heating up, but not focus. How, how does that focus work or the, the targeting? Yeah. And is, is it there? Yeah, no. And that's great. And it's like a great sort of like point to wrap on, because yeah. um, the key to our model is that, again, it's a unified brand. So we're this global community of one percent for the planet members and environmental partners and each of those members is giving in in line with their particular interests. So if you joined and you have an interest in the garbage patch, you get to give and focus on that. And our team helps you like find who's the environmental partner that's doing work on that topic in a way that resonates with you and sort of meets your particular criteria. So, you know, truly the the beauty of the model is that it's this unified collective action brand in which every member is differentiated by their particular giving strategy. Yeah. Really cool. Really cool. We could talk for hours on this. I love this. (laughs) This is really cool. Um, I hope you'll come back on and maybe, you know, in a year or so, give us kind of a touch base on where you were. And, you know, you were at that 5X. Did you make it to 10X? Have you made it to a billion yet? Are we working on two? Let's let's uh, let's have a touch base in about a year or so and see how things are going. Maybe after the next summit. Yeah. After the next summit. We'll chat again. So if people want to get involved, you know, like we talk, whether it's a smaller business or some Fortune 500 CEO watching this, what do they do? What are their next steps? Yeah, I think one next step will take you to all of it. So 1%fortheplanet.org, all spelled out in letters, 1%fortheplanet.org will take you to our homepage where you can click through to the auction, which we were talking about earlier. We have a um, we have a link right there on the homepage. You can also um, click through to, um, fill out what we call our join form, which is just a place where you provide some basic information and you're not committed to anything, but it just tees you up to get some further information and have an opportunity to connect with one of our team members to learn more about membership and how that can work for you. I love it. I love it. Kate Williams. Thank you for for coming on. This is this is fascinating. These these kind of conversations always they I always end excited, enthusiastic, and optimistic, and also a little depressed because there's so much to do, you know. But but I'm happy that there are people that are you know that helping do that stuff. So thank you for all that you do. Thank you for your participation and working with the Flickr team on this auction. I know they're super excited about working with you. And uh, yeah, and thanks for coming on the show. I appreciate you. And I will 
I'll link everything that you mentioned in the show notes for this episode, as well as in the blog post that this, uh, this video will be embedded in. And we'll see if we can move the needle or help move the needle on, on the 1% for the planet. Thank you. We really appreciate it. 